Hi, I'm Brett Beckman, Board Certified Veterinary Dentist, and welcome to the Vet Dental Show. We do these every Wednesday for the veterinarian and technician team and pass on things that you can take home in brief episodes that last 10 to 20 minutes that you can put into place in your practice and implement pretty much immediately in most cases. So what we're going to talk about today is feline stomatitis. There is a lot of confusion around this disease, its diagnosis and its treatment. So we are going to give you an overview of how we approach this disease in our specialty practice and how we would suggest that you approach it in general practice as well. So there is somewhat confusion about feline stomatitis where you can get inflammatory conditions around the dentition by from multiple different entities. You can have juvenile onset gingivitis, juvenile onset periodontitis. You can have some other immune inflammatory diseases that cause changes around the dentition. But there's only one condition that causes the caudal oral pharynx beyond the dentition that results in inflammation bilaterally, and that is feline stomatitis. So once you can recognize that that extension back into that caudal oral cavity of any inflammation of the gingiva around the dentition is present, that is pathognomonic for feline stomatitis. There's no need for biopsy of that unless you feel that there's significant differences between both sides, especially in older patients, because some patients that have feline stomatitis can certainly have concurrent squamous cell carcinoma or other neoplasia, but most namely squamous cell carcinoma that can result and does result from chronic inflammation, which is the characteristic of feline stomatitis. So once that diagnosis is made, the main thing we want to do is immediately provide some type of pain uh, management for these cases. And most of the time, for, for short-term effect, the best pain management is also what we don't like to do or what don't recommend doing long-term, which is not effective, and that is uh, prednisolone. So if you have a severe case, it's severely compromise from a pain standpoint, not eating, pawing at the mouth, dropping food, you can certainly start with a high dose of prednisolone twice a day and then drop down to that every other day eventually until that patient can come in and have a procedure done. And when I say come in and have a procedure done, the only practices that I recommend do full mouth extractions in feline stomatitis cases are practices who have significant experience in surgical extractions. These cases are extremely difficult to manage. There are complicating factors like tooth resorption. There are, uh, there, there are cases where we have ankylosis and tooth resorption, and essentially all tooth remnants have to be removed from the entire oral cavity, including alveolectomy, where we're taking a, t a diamond, usually taper burn, we're going in after we do the extraction, we're gently removing any remnants of periodontal ligament with that alveolus and then flushing that really, really well before we close. <clears throat> but along that line, managing that tissue is very difficult. If you've not had training specifically and have done multiple cases of periodontitis in cats where you're extracting multiple teeth, and have that under your belt for months to years, then it's not a good idea to try to take on these cases. The thing that we see most commonly in our specialty practice are cases that have had partial extractions for somatitis where the disease was misdiagnosed. And I'm not implying that th this is gonna happen in your practice, but this is what we observe quite commonly because we get these cases after they've had extractions and they are no better, or in many cases they're worse because there are two teeth left or um, more pronounced root tips left that must be removed before that patient can even begin 
to start to resolve. So in the initial management of these steroids and or other analgesics, if the patient can take it from a medical standpoint, as far as the individual goes, and then getting these patients for referral in most cases to have full mouth extractions and pain management before, during, and after the procedure, and then in that respect managed from a post standpoint to be able to evaluate the patient and determine whether they are progressing, whether they are fully recovered, whether they need to have further care or further options that are available when we do have those refractory cases. Now, that being said, with the general population and what you see in the literature, 70 to 80% of those patients will respond so that after three months, there is no additional care required and they are uh, pain-free. <clears throat> but you've got that 30 to 20% of patients that do require some additional care whether it be something as simple as uh, every other day prednisolone or uh, gabapentin or other pain management modalities that are m minimal just to keep them comfortable until they finally resolve. That, that's one spectrum. Uh, usually by three months, if they're gonna resolve and they have no more pain, no more clinical signs, they are going to be free of any additional care. Now, some of those will still have some degree of erythema, and that is a function of that tissue being such a chronically affected tissue that it takes longer for those patients to minimize that tissue inflammation. Many of those patients are pain-free based on palpation and based on the ability for us to keep that mouth open for an extended period of time and touch that tissue, many of those patients will also, if we open the mouth, they will vehemently object to that, and so those are the ones at that period that we need to consider other options for. One thing that we do quite commonly now is we do injectable interferon or verbigen, and that is available only through Europe and is imported in vials of five at a time. And we use the European protocol, which I won't go into, but it involves injections over a period of time of high-dose verbigen, and many of those patients will resolve that are otherwise refractory patients. We use cryotherapy much less now since we use that modality versus a low-dose verbigen where we give an initial subcutaneous dose, and then we follow that up with a series of 50 daily doses of oral. <clears throat> so now that we have that high dose that we've been using, we've been successful with it. We don't use cryotherapy quite as much, but there are still patients that are, have, have had verbigen that have not responded just as much as we'd like them to, and they still have proliferative tissue. So we will do cryotherapy, and that involves going in with what we call, or what, what's called a cryoprobe, which allows us to do two freeze-thaw cycles on that inflamed tissue, both adjacent to the arcade if it's present, and also in that caudal pharyngeal area that's inflamed. And with that, we get immediate pain relief as when the patient goes home, and then that duration varies from forever, or sometimes they have to come back for several treatments. We've had some in the, in the distant past that have had to come back for multiple treatments periodically throughout their lives over a six to 12 month period, which is very doable and very cost effective and very manageable for the client. And there are a lot of other modalities that have been used. You can, you can read up on those, gold salts, gold therapy, all of those have some degree of literature time, if you will, but there's nothing that is as effective as those two modalities in addition to plus or minus cyclosporin, which some people really like, some people don't get as much of a result with that as, as they would like, and we're in that camp, but um, that's certainly an option for you. So those three things are options, but those, those are tough to manage, those are tough to make decisions on, and so that's why it's much better to allow a specialist to take care of those and manage those for you, both intra-op, pre-op, and post-operatively in order to make sure that we 
have the best outcome for those patients because they are so painful and they don't deserve to, to be painful any longer than they need to. And so please, once you get these patients in your practice, once you make the diagnosis, there, there's no reason to delay going to surgery. And I know some of you are kind of faced with the conundrum where you really don't have anybody that you can refer to. Maybe the client doesn't want to go for referral. Those are all decisions that you have to make on whether you can help the patient or whether it, you're beyond your comfort zone. You know, the main thing you don't want to do is go in and based on the client's recommendation that, you know, go ahead, I know you're not real experienced with this, but I, I want you to do it and then run into all kinds of problems with, with the patient. So those are all the choices that you need to make on an individual basis. Not an easy disease to treat, not an easy disease to manage. So make those decisions on your own. And if you're doing extractions on stomatitis cases and you're having good success, great for you. It's just amazing that some of the people, especially my students that have been through the, the programs that we've got, especially the IVDI Veterinary Dental Practitioner Program that are either going through that currently or have graduated from that program that are super, super talented and skilled and well-trained to perform things like that and many other things as well. So if you're in that group, my hat's off to you. If you're, if you're getting to the point where you're getting that proficiency and at close to that level, again, congratulations on that. And for all of you who are getting to that point, you'll get there. It's just a matter of time. You just have to put in the hours and make, make it a cadaver experience multiple times over the year to make sure that you're getting quicker and make sure that your techniques and your skills are, are where they are. So congratulations on finishing this episode, and I hope that gives you some insight on feline stomatitis. If you have any questions, post them in the Facebook group. We'll be glad to uh, respond to those next time. And anytime you have questions, we're here every Wednesday. Be happy to see you in the Facebook group. Be happy to see you here each Wednesday. And until next Wednesday, have a great week, and we'll see you soon. Take care.